Thank you, Todd, for the beer to keep me lubricated during the reading. Um, you know, reading in Pine Creek, especially reading something brief, made me think about reading something that had to do with my residency in Pine Creek, which was most of the 1970s. So I wrote, you know, some movies, I, I wrote a couple novels, I wrote a lot of Sports Illustrated stories, and none of them seemed to quite fit what this evening was inviting. So I, I, I tried to find some tenuous connection, and, and um, I decided to read a story that I actually wrote when I was 25 years old on the island of uh, Formentera, which is the smallest Balearic island off the coast of Spain. I was trying to write uh, my second novel, having discovered that my first novel was not going to ever be bought by anyone, and that my efforts to carve short stories out of it were going to lead nowhere. So I, 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 wrote, I wrote my second novel, which turned out to be my second failed novel, although it did get me a, a Wallace Stegner Fellowship. And um, I learned at uh, Stanford that you could take of something that you'd already written completely through and start all over again at the beginning and scrap almost everything and keep the essentials and come up with something better, even if not worthy of publication. So. Um, out of that second failed novel, I was in a process of trying to carve stories from it. And this is a story that I did carve from it, and I sold it to a magazine called We Magazine while living down across from the church. Now, probably most people don't remember We Magazine, but it was a, a Hugh Hefner publication that was designed to counteract Penthouse's full pubic onslaught. And Pen uh, Playboy wasn't ready to go there, so they created We Magazine, which was supposed to be sort of European, and, 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 and therefore a little racier. So I brought as a show and tell the very, the very copy of We Magazine. However, uh, there's no way on earth, unlike Scott, that I could actually read the print in a magazine, so I, I had it blown up for, for, for the senior citizen that is lurking within me, fighting against the 25-year-old that wrote this story. So anyway, it was published under the title Last Rites. And, and I'll do one last thing. This story is half true. I mean, this is like, it's the beginning of how, of when I learned that you could take your actual biography and move with it into a direction that was totally fictional. And, and I've since discovered that even if you write about vampires and robots and whatever, there still has got to be something that is you, that is within that, to give it some kind of breath of life. So. Anyway, so this is called Last Rites. My father died when I was 11, six months after he moved his restaurant business from New York to Florida. He had a heart attack while driving down from Tampa and managed to stagger into a drugstore before collapsing in the phone booth. My mother insists he knew the end was coming and tried to call her with his last breath. But something about the tone of her voice makes me think she holds it against him for dying before he got his dime in the slot. My father was cremated according to his wishes. I remember sitting alone with mother on a plush velvet couch in the crematorium. A somber gentleman with the manners of a head waiter drew back the velour drapes in front of us and we looked into an antiseptic white tiled room. In the center stood my father's coffin, resting on a stainless steel table and surrounded by showy banks of memorial flowers. The lid was closed now, and the mahogany sides shone with a luster as bright as my new cordobin shoes. A faint organ tremolo signaled the entrance of two workmen wearing khaki janitor's uniforms. They wheeled the table over to a vault-like door on the end wall. My, father, my mother turned her face away, weeping. There wasn't much more to see. The iron door opened and the workman took hold of the brass handles and slid the coffin inside. The curtains silently closed. 
the show was over. For the rest of the year, Mother kept my father's ashes in a number 10 can in the hall closet. I knew, uh, I knew it was there behind the galoshes. When my mother was away for the day, I carried it out into the living room and tried to get the lid off. I was curious to know how they condensed my father, a big man who weighed over 200 pounds, as well as that bulky, polished coffin down into such a small can. The lid was jammed on tight. I was afraid to go at it with a screwdriver for fear of leaving telltale scratches. Finally, I held the can under the hot water tap in the bathtub. 20 minutes of steam treatment. Back in the living room, I wrapped a towel around the lid for traction and tugged. The hot water did the trick. The lid came off easily, but I upset the can on the rug. My father's remains spilled out across the living room floor. I sat horrified while above my head a thick white cloud of powdery ash hovered in the sunlight, <laughs> precipitating gently onto the coffee table and couch. When terror passed, I dusted myself off and considered the situation. Things weren't so bad. I knew my mother was out for the afternoon and the door was locked against unexpected visitors. I decided to indulge my curiosity and began prodding through the ashes with a pencil like a sneezing Sherlock Holmes. A quantity of the ticklish stuff had gotten up my nose. I was looking for something solid, a brass coffin handle or dentures, anything that would equate what had come out of the furnace with what I had seen going in. But I found nothing substantial enough to suggest bone or coffin parts or the heavy Masonic ring I had never seen my father without, not even the morning of his funeral when it glittered on his folded wax-like hands. My father had been a work of art, a testimonial to the mortician's skill. So lifelike was the comment of Mrs. Friedman, our lawyer's wife. But he had been much more than that much more than lifelike. The shadows under his eyes had been eradicated along with the liver splotches on his cheeks, and his lips were rouged like a silent movie actor's. My father's corpse was a flattering caricature of the man he had been in life. Crafty fellows, these morticians. They restore the dead with the skill of taxidermists, nostrils plugged to prevent leakage, jaws wired shut to avoid the embarrassment of a yawning mouth during the funeral services, and they possessed a fire intense enough to reduce even chunks of metal to the consistency of chalk dust. But I'm on to them. I found them out 14 years ago when I poked through my father's ashes with the pointed tip of a pencil. Behind those impressive crematorium doors lurked hired underlings who wrenched my poor father from his coffin, stripped him of his jewelry and gold teeth, and tossed him naked into the fire. And the coffin, with the satin cushions smoothed out, was wheeled back to the showroom to be resold. How I longed to change my costume in the security of a secret cave and emerge as Batman or Straight Arrow to expose this gang. The real problem was cleaning up the mess in the living room. No explaining would have helped. Not even uncovering the mortician's plot would excuse the desecration of my father's ashes. I scraped what I could back into the can, but it was still half empty. Mother would have detected the difference in weight, so I filled it the rest of the way with a box of cake mix from the kitchen and tamped the lid firmly into place. I was using the vacuum cleaner on the rug when the doorbell rang, some well-meaning neighbor coming to offer belated condolences. Just a minute, I called, clicking off the machine. I carried the can, now half Betty Crocker, back to its resting place in the closet. The frustrated buzzing continued. I swung open the front door. It was Scotty Sickler, a sixth grade classmate. Hiya, Scotty said, what you been doing? Nothing special, I said, blocking the door. Look, Scotty, uh, you can't come in right now. 
Why not? Doctor's orders. The, horse is the house is quarantined because I've got the measles. Oh, that's okay then. I've already had the measles. Which kind? Both kinds. German and regular. So it's okay. I'll come in and keep you company for a while. Damn you, Scotty Sickler, I thought. You and your damned immunity to disease. If you found out about the living room, it'd be all over school by lunch period recess Monday morning. No, I don't think you better, Scotty. I said, uh, uh, what I've got is the Turkish measles. The Turkish measles? Yeah, yeah, it's different. See? No spots. Well, I've never heard of any Turkish measles. Well, it's very contagious, I said. Right this minute, you could be getting infected with it. Okay, okay. Scotty backed away a few feet. Are you sure it's the Turkish measles? That's what the doctor said. Scotty climbed back on his bicycle. I closed the door and leaned back against it. Scotty Sickler was a great fishing friend, but no one to trust with a secret. In the living room, I discovered the cat had been into the ashes. His paw prints tracked through every room in the house. It took over an hour to vacuum up the last incriminating traces of my father. The number 10 can stayed in the hall closet until the end of summer when mother sold the house and we returned to New York. We took a cruise ship from Miami. The second day out, my mother said she had something she wanted to talk about in the cabin. This is very serious, Benji, she said, and very sad. I couldn't say anything at, about it at mealtimes because of all the other people at the table. There are some things a family has to keep to itself. She sat next to me on the lower bunk and gripped my hand. You know, Benji, when your father passed away, that was a sad time for both of us, and I don't like to remind you. But you see, your father hasn't really gone to his final resting place yet. Benji, it was his desire to be buried at sea. He loved the water so much. I was off fishing, never at home. It's fitting. It's where he wanted to be. Please, Mom, you're hurting my hand. Her fingernails had left a painful row of indentations across the back of my hand. I didn't mean to hurt you, dear. It's all right. I've never hurt you. You know that. Never in your life have I hurt you. I never said you did, Mom. Don't you ever tell me that I've hurt you. I won't, Mom. I took my mother's hand and gave it a big squeeze. Honest, I won't. Oh, I know, Benji. You're a good boy. She blew her nose into a Kleenex. Uh, what were you saying about Pop being buried at sea? I felt silly about referring to a can of ashes and cake mix as Pop. <laughs> Mother sniffed. I have his ashes here on the boat. I couldn't say anything at, about it at the table the way those others are always snooping. Certain things are private. This morning I went to see the captain about a funeral. Something simple was all I wanted. Just the chaplain or yourself to say a few words, I told him. It was my husband's last request. His oldest friend in the merchant marine was torpedoed during the war and went down with his ship. I was sure the captain would understand that. After all, he's a nautical man himself. But he said no. Something about regulations, he said. Can you believe it, Benji? A little thing, a prayer for the dead, and he refused. What kind of regulations would stop a man from praying? Mother shredded her Kleenex into her lap. Then uh, we're not going to have a funeral? I mean, what are we going to do with Pop? A spark of panic was touched off at this possibility, igniting the fear that my mother might have some more romantic plan in mind for the disposal of my father's ashes, like scattering to the winds over New York City from an airplane. What would she say when the first handful turned out to be powdered angel food cake mix? <laughs> Mother dabbed at her eyes with a torn piece of clean tissue no bigger than a postage stamp. We're going to take care of things ourselves, Benji, she said. We'll hold our own funeral. I'm sure your father wouldn't mind that. I've arranged with the florist on the promenade deck to send down a nice bouquet tomorrow morning. Then we'll find a quiet spot on deck and have a simple Christian service all by ourselves. The next morning after breakfast, my mother and I made our appearance on A-deck. We are dressed completely in black in spite of the September heat. I wore the woolen suit that had hung in my closet since the day of my father's cremation. Mother had on a veil. We walked single file with slowly measured steps down the entire length of the deck. In my arm, I carried an immense basket of white roses, 
my father's favorite, while my mother carried father himself his little can all done up with ribbons and a bow like a gift box of chocolates. We stood together by the rail at the stern, and while I dropped the roses a blossom at a time into the boiling wake, my mother read aloud from the order for the burial of the dead from the Book of Common Prayer. I remember her reading the obsequies in a voice strong enough to carry over the noise of a shuffleboard game in progress behind us. Unto Almighty God we entrust the soul of our brother departed, Mother read, and we commit his body to the deep. And with that she tumbled the beribbon can off the rail. I watched it fall, end over end, and saw it swallowed up soundlessly in the foam. Dozens of white roses, together with the floating peels of several hundred oranges, marked the spot where it went under the surface. Let us pray, my mother intoned, bowing her head. I folded my hands in a gesture of piety, but my thoughts were far away from mother's mumbled prayers. I was thinking of my father's can on its final journey to the bottom of the sea. Even at that moment, the water was slowly seeping in activating the cake mix as the can spiraled deeper and deeper. I thought of the mix foaming into a batter, forcing the lid and easing my father in a sweet souffle out of the cruel confines of the can. All along the way, for fathoms and fathoms, schools of blue water fish gathering to feed. Thank you very much.